Now, due to Aurangzeb's default policy of protecting temples, most, although, although not all, of the tens of thousands of Hindu and Jain temples located within Mughal domains still stood at the end of his reign. Nobody knows the exact number of temples demolished or pillaged on Aurangzeb's orders, and we never will. We will never have that number. Dr. Richard Eaton is the leading authority on this subject. He puts the number of confirmed temple destructions during Alamgir's rule at just over a dozen, with fewer tied to the emperor's direct command. I raise that number to closer to 15. That's by adding in a few orders that Eaton missed or discounted for certain reasons, particularly against the Somnath Temple and Ahmedabad's Chintamen Temple. We, of course, still fall far short of the wild estimates of 10,000 or even 60,000 that one here is sort of, you know, thrown about in charged political context. In the case of temple destruction in pre-modern India, it really is a fool's errand to get swept up in a numbers game, to follow Eaton's, to borrow Eaton's expression. We stand on much firmer ground in reconstructing the reasons why Aurangzeb targeted specific temples while leaving the vast majority untouched. Political events incited Aurangzeb to initiate assaults on certain Hindu temples. So to take a very prominent example, Aurangzeb ordered Banaras' Vishwanatha temple demolished in 1669 in order to punish political missteps by people associated with that temple. So specifically, the Vishwanatha temple had been built during Akbar's reign by Raja Man Singh, whose great-grandson, Jai Singh, many believed helped Shivaji escape from Aurangzeb's court in 1666. Aurangzeb was not happy about that. Additionally, in 1669 itself, a rebellion had broken out among Banar's landlords connected to this temple. Now, a mosque was erected on the former site of Banaras' Vishwanatha temple. You can see an image of that structure here, and it does incorporate sort of part of the temple wall. We don't know who built this masjid, and we don't know why. Right? Many people assume that Aurangzeb did, but I have found no historical evidence to support that. What we do know is that there may well have been some religious reasons in addition to the political issues at play in the decision to target the Vishwanatha temple, as opposed to one of the other many temples in Benares. Although these are not the religious reasons that most people tend to think of. So in 1669, according, this is according to one of the historians of the period, Aurangzeb learned that, quote, in Tata, Multan, and especially at Benares, Deviant Brahmins were teaching false books at their established schools. Curious seekers, Hindu and Muslim alike, traveled great distances to gain depraved knowledge from them. Generations of Mughal kings had attempted to curb certain religious behaviors, especially those of errant Brahmins who, in Mughal eyes, took advantage of the less sophisticated. So, for example, Akbar took to task Brahmins for misrepresenting Hindu texts to the lower caste, right? And I take no position on whether that was true or not, but that was Akbar's accusation. Akbar hoped that translating some Sanskrit texts into Persian would prompt these arrogant leaders, again his opinion, to reform their ways. Aurangzeb similarly evinces concern here with elite Brahmins deceiving common Hindus about their shared religion. Aurangzeb was perhaps especially alarmed that Muslims were also falling prey to such charlatans. Banarasi Brahmins, by the way, may even have financially profited from these sorts of ventures. The French traveler Jean de Tibenu expressed the opinion that Banaras Brahmins find their profit in lavish festivals that draw large crowds. Aurangzeb paternalistically intervened in other areas of his subjects' religious lives as well. Right? So this sort of thing was not exceptional, it was quite normal for him. So for instance, he curbed overly zealous public celebrations of both Hindu and Muslim religious festivals, such as Holi and Eid. He tried to ban alcohol, prostitution, and opium 
He was wildly unsuccessful in all three of those ventures. The key point for me is this. Aurangzeb thought that guiding his subjects in proper religious practice within the structures of either Hinduism or Islam, that that was a component for him to be a just king. Overall, Aurangzeb did not seem to identify religious difference as particularly important, though, in the exercise of justice and certainly not for service to the Mughal state. So, for instance, in the sixth in the 1680s, he is said to have, to have rejected as bigotry a suggestion made by a Sunni that Shias be excluded from Mughal state service. Aurangzeb told that guy to get lost. Aurangzeb also increased Hindu participation in the Mughal nobility by about 50% in comparison to Shah Jahan, Jahangir, and even Akbar. Now, religion, of course, did matter to Aurangzeb who does appear to have been the most pious of the major Mughal kings. But let us be wary about our modern assumptions of what it means to be a good Muslim and what constitutes orthodoxy. So Aurangzeb's Islam featured Sufism, for instance. To take one example, around 1680, the king and two of his sons visited the shrine of Mawinuddin Shishti in Ajmer. Right? And you can see... You can see Aurangzeb right there. Aurangzeb was also buried at a Sufi shrine, a Shishti shrine at that in Maharashtra. Aurangzeb's Islam was also talismanic. He once wrote out prayers and had them sewn to banners and standards that were then carried into battle against enemies of the Mughal state. On another occasion, he threw written prayers into floodwaters, thus, so the story goes, causing the floodwaters to subside. So Aurangzeb's piety, in my view, was part of his vision of what it meant to be a just sovereign. And yet, his piety was perhaps not what we assume today. Moreover, when religion and politics conflicted, Aurangzeb invariably chose earthly power. The limits of Aurangzeb Alamgir's commitment to justice and piety tell us a great deal about this king. And a prime example is the siege of Bijapur. In 1685, Aurangzeb besieged Bijapur, an independent Muslim-led kingdom in southern India. The assault was part of the sort of southward expansion efforts that occupied the last few decades of the king's reign. The siege was brutal to severely understates the case. The Mughal army trapped around 30,000 Bijapuri soldiers within the city walls and then starved them of food, water, and medicine for more than a year. At one point during this conflict, a delegation of Bijapuri ulama approached Aurangzeb and they asked him to halt this deadly siege. Their grounds for doing so were to say that warring against fellow Muslims was unjust for a man, Aurangzeb, who was himself Muslim. Now, according to their shared set of values and interpretations of Sharia common at the time, the ulama were correct, but Aurangzeb was unmoved by their pleas and their argument. This siege ended after an obscenely high death toll, only when Sikandar Abdul Shah, Bijapur's leader, surrendered and bowed low in the dust before Aurangzeb's feet. After entering Bijapur Fort, Aurangzeb ordered some of his men to destroy some palace wall paintings. Was this iconoclasm an attempt to show adherence to some hardline interpretation of Sharia, which Aurangzeb has so blatantly disregarded during the siege itself? Possibly. But I doubt that anybody on the ground was fooled. Rather, I think most people probably understood all too clearly the logic behind Aurangzeb's actions. When the king's ideals conflicted with his thirst for political power, Aurangzeb invariably chose power. As Bhim Sain, a Kayist who served Aurangzeb on and off in the Deccan Wars, put it, I found the men of this world very greedy, so much so that an emperor like Aurangzeb Alamgir, who wants for nothing, has been seized by such a longing and a passion for taking forts that he personally runs about panting for some heaps of stone. 
Aurangzeb Alamgir initiated a lot of state violence, regardless of the religions of his targets. He frequently, although not always, tried diplomacy first. So for instance, Aurangzeb's army beat Shivaji on the battlefield in the mid-1660s. Aurangzeb did not kill Shivaji, but rather offered to let Shivaji rule certain areas of central India as long as he operated under the umbrella of Mughal sovereignty. Shivaji acted suspiciously at the Mughal court, however, going against Adab. He then soon fled down south. Aurangzeb pursued Shivaji for the next decade and a half until Shivaji's death. When, in 1689, Aurangzeb finally got his hands on Shivaji's son and successor, Sambaji, the Mughal king showed the Maratha no mercy. There are legends popular today that, that Aurangzeb offered Shivaji leniency if only he would convert to Islam. In my opinion, that is hogwash. Sambaji was a dead man the second he was captured by Mughal forces. There is no way conversion would have saved him. Aurangzeb had Samba's eyes stabbed out with nails and then had him beheaded. Some historians report that Sambaji's body was thrown to the dogs while his head was strung up on one of Delhi's gates. Aurangzeb was harsh to those who stood in his way regarding political power, including those related to him. During the War of Succession, he killed two of his brothers, and he would have killed the third, Shah Shuja, if Shah Shuja had not fled to Burma first. It's the only reason he lives, as he gets away. He also overthrew his father, Shah Jahan, and kept him under house arrest for seven years until the deposed king died. This was a problem for Aurangzeb. During that period, officials in Mecca refused to accept Aurangzeb's gifts, saying that they came from an illegitimate king. Everyone agreed you could kill your brothers, but overthrowing your father, that was a problem with Sharia. Aurangzeb didn't budge. He chose power over piety. Aurangzeb also showed little mercy to his sons. After Prince Akbar rebelled, for instance, in 1681, Aurangzeb chased him out of India to Persia, where Prince Akbar died in exile 23 years later, in 1704. There was no reconciliation. Before I conclude my discussion of the historical Aurangzeb, let me briefly address with you one of the chief charges leveled against him today, namely that he was responsible for the downfall of the Mughal Empire. Aurangzeb Alamgir grew the Mughal Empire to its greatest extent in history. We all agree upon that. 